Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Unconventional Soldier podcast, which aims to record the history of the British Army's STA patrols unit through the voices of veterans who served in its ranks. Today, we're talking to Pete Walsh about the International Long Range Recurrence Patrol School, where members of the Special OP Troop carried out much of their training during the Cold War in the 1980s. We're also going to cover the history of resistance interrogation training and how it's conducted. And uh, along the way, we'll also cover the British mission to Soviet forces in Germany, known as Brixmas, which operated behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany during the Cold War. And this is where a few soldiers from the troop carried out attachments to the unit and were primarily based in the isolated city of West Berlin. And as usual, we'll finish off with Desert Island Ditch, which is Pete's choice of film, book and luxury item he would take to Desert Island. As a follow-up, some items from the last podcast. We covered a number of Cold War tactics with the introduction of subsurface shelters, which provided protection and a cache of equipment to sustain a patrol over three weeks, including in the nuclear, biological or chemical environment. The development of evasion tactics, preparation and training, and the challenges of communications, especially long-range and ensuring that accurate and timely reports of enemy dispositions were sent, and nothing else mattered apart from getting that detail over. We also discussed over the last few episodes the question of patrol survivability, and in today's climate, would there still be the same appetite for this level of risk involved in the stay behind concept? As normal, we'll start with our guest military bio, leading up to when they volunteer for the selection course. So Pete, tell us how you got involved in STA patrols then. Well, um, my family's always been sort of military. Uh, my grandfather flew spits in the uh, Second World War. Dad joined the Navy in 1949. Brother joined the RAF. Middle brother joined the Navy. So I thought, well, I've got to get in there. Uh, but I wanted to join the Army. Uh, so I joined the R- Junior Leader Regiment, Nuneaton, uh, September the 12th, 1978. Uh, spent a year there. Basic guns. Trained on a 25-pounder. Loved it. Absolutely loved uh, field gunnery. At the end, I went to Edinburgh Tattoo, did uh, six weeks there, on a guard, jumping up, uh, marching up and down. Uh, October, joined my regiment in Dortmund, 2-6 Field. Basically, did five days, being a boxer, straight down the gym. So I was in the gym most of my time. Did a few courses. Abbott course, hated. I hated SP gunnery. All you did was track split, pack lifts. Had a chance, went on the conventional OPs, stayed on there for a couple of years. Got bored again, boxing, boxing. It seems like an idyllic world, boxing or training or doing things like that. But when you're at six o'clock in the morning till half past ten at night, Monday to Fridays, I just got bored of that. I just thought, well, I want to be a soldier. So well, in 70... A, so, sorry, but you, you did get a mention on Ian's course about um, how handy your boxing um, training came in and, during the I milling. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's the thing about milling. It's all changed. Uh, I, um, as I said, I got bored with um, green life. Uh, and at 19, I volunteered to go to Fortin Inn, which you had to do a course in Germany, which I passed. Then you went to UK. My uh, course was at Swinnerton in Staffordshire. Uh, first week or first part of the camp is two weeks. Uh, I did that. And then I was dragged in the office and they said, well, we're not taking you to camp too. You're too young. And I sort of looked at him and went, well, didn't you know that I was 19 when I joined? He went, well, we didn't think you'd get that far. Not happy. Back to I oh, know, I oh, know. I actually just went home. Uh, my father was a police officer at the time, so I thought, mm, I better go and uh, re-report to uh, Woolwich. Back to my regiment. Again, regimental life. At the end of the day, we used to sit on our battery steps, and one day the BSM leant out the window and just said to Chas Brawford and I, do you want to do an OP course? Never heard of the special OPs. Do you want to do an OP course? It'll be a couple of weeks. Yes. Jumped on the Land Rover, had the kit, you know, got out of the Land Rover here all the time. All of a sudden, screaming skull, rocky ears. I just thought, oh, my giddy aunt, I'm back at flipping 14 in. But that was it. We uh, BFT that morning, CFT in the afternoon, out onto the uh, Vold. And that was the selection started. And so you, you had no, literally, you did no training, no prep. You just were thrown straight on it. Yep, absolutely nothing. No, um, like uh, jo- uh, Ian Strachan was saying, uh, um, all course one had interviews to go on uh, uh, to uh, join the, uh, the, the, as it was, troop. Nothing for us. BSM, out the window, do you fancy doing an OP course? I mean, they were absolutely shocked because Chas Borford was um, one of the FOOs, uh, OP acts, and I was the other. So in one foul sloop, they lost both their um, OP acts. Uh, any joint instructions or any briefings? Not, not a thing. Nothing. <laughs> Just go to Hill Design, 
We right. drove up there. One of the lads drove us up. We jumped out of the Land Rover and Rocky started screaming at us. Do you think in retrospect that was a bonus, the fact that you didn't know anything about it? I think um, it, if it, we hadn't been fa- fairly fit, both Chaz and I, um, we were boxing at the time. Chaz sort of, you know, he was like the second string boxer and he used to like join in with us. Uh, and we were fairly fit. But no, I mean, it, it was quite shocking to, to do a BFT one minute and the CFT, in, you know, in the afternoon and then you're in the field and it was, as as Ian was saying, you know, you, you partnered up and, and, you know, that was it. It was, uh, you know, on your mark. When, when you're set, on the... Uh, when you're on the OPs in your, your the field regiment, did you do many trips like in the jungle or dismounted work? Was it all, all mechanised? Mechanised, mechanised. You did uh, a remote forward. We did do um, tabs. They were light scale. You know, you you had um, just your fighting order and maybe you know a, one berg in between the whole patrol. Uh, we did do one exercise when someone decided it would be a good idea to man pack the ZB which was the, uh, the old radio blower, that was an absolute nightmare. I mean, the ZB itself was okay, but the batteries, we had two batteries, and they were a complete nightmare. That was, a, that was an old radar, wasn't it? Is that yeah. right? ZB-298? Yeah. 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 And they had the old type batteries where if you took leaked them upside down, all the flipping acid came out of them. You know, deep fun. That was, you know, having a man pack all exercise with one of them. But, you know, generally, no, not really. You drove up in your ferret and your 432, and you chased tanks around, basically. So how did you find the whole course then? I if found... you didn't know from the beginning, you wouldn't yeah. know what the course looked like. 14 didn't really help. That, uh, the selection for 14 didn't really help because it was basically much the same as that. You know, you're given lots of tasks to do. You were working on your own. You were told, you know, you've got to be from A to B. Don't leave this man. Don't leave your rifle. And, and I, I didn't find it physically hard. And uh, being I said, you know, we trained from 6 o'clock in the morning to half past 10 at night, days a week. Okay, you weren't running with boots on, but... You know, just you had that mental resilience that boxing gives as well. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And we were young, you know, you know, nineteen eighty-two because uh, eight course one was in July and we started in October. Obviously, we had the winter course, so uh, doing the river crossing at December the seventeenth was deep joy. <laughs> Wonder why I had three lumps in the throat. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on now, and uh, we mentioned the Lerp School. With Ian, so Kev, do you just want to cover mm. a bit on the the LERP school as an intro before Pete? Yeah, the uh, the International Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol School, or ILERPS as we knew it, was established in 1979 and was formerly located when we used to go through the course in Weigarten in Germany. Its task was to train NATO Special Operation Forces and similar type units in advanced patrolling, reconnaissance, medical, close quarter battle, sniper, survival planning, and recognition skills. All special observers, once they'd done the course, the uh, the special OP selection course, had to carry out a number of mandated courses. These included survival with R to I or resistance to interrogation, specialist recognition, and the patrol leaders course. And then there was other courses we had to also attend later on: ops planning, CQB, um, medical. So most soldiers attended more courses than the original two mandated, and in 1997, it moved to Fullendorf in Germany as renamed the International Special Training Centre. And then the UK ceased its participation in the centre in 2001. So, Pete, what courses did you do there? And what did you think of that training, that multinational environment? I loved it. I loved the school. Uh, it, was, it was really good training, really well run. Uh, we started off with Battle for Survival, uh, which was two weeks. Most all the courses were two weeks. Battle for Survival went straight onto E and E. Now, course two were actually the first uh, lot to go down there. I uh, smashed my ankle in, so I did. I went on the next course. Now, the first course, E and E, it was only a two hour or two and ten, two hours of interrogation within twelve hours of holding. Or the only thing was that to get the course or the the qualification, you needed the twenty four hour. So when we went down with with course one, I I went down with course one. It changed to. Eight and twenty-four. So within 20, 24 hours of holding, you did eight hours of interrogation, and it was running the old uh, French camp because mm. the, the the German and the French camp, and so water pouring down the walls, really cold. But it, I, you know, for the first twenty-four hour exercise, um, I enjoyed. Well, I say I enjoyed it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if you enjoy holding the wall yeah. off for twenty-four yeah. hours. Yeah. <laughs> it had to be done. I wanted my pay, so you know, and it was something to get done. You know, and it was yeah. doable, not 
I wouldn't say extremely hard, but yeah, yeah. So that was the, that was my first two. We did four weeks, uh, two weeks battlefield survival, uh, which was you know you lost your Bergen, and then you had to operate without just on your fighting order, which was okay for the British, but the Americans when they just had a water bottle, and yeah. you know they weren't very happy. But yeah, great, great courses. Uh, then specialist recognition again was a uh, as you said a trade necessary course and that was Mr. Spotter but really good I mean uh, that was really well run again but dear oh dear didn't you have to learn some uh, bits of kit uh, Winter Patrol was my next one uh, I I um, turned up with Brian Devaney and uh, Mick Scaife both of them seasoned skiers I jumped off the truck and they said you know it's everybody's got to be as a medium or you know skier I'd never skied in my life so I just <laughs> ran these flipping planks for two weeks falling over when I wanted to stop. But again, great course. The only thing was that the, the, the courses you went on there, they used to give you the German paratrooper G3s. And the German paratrooper G3 has a metal stock. So when you when you went up to shoot, things stuck to your chin. Because right? <laughs> cold weather. And it was, you know, I don't think you thought of us, did you? You know, people stuck with this G3 on their chin. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, again, I enjoyed that course. Lerp Leaders was the next one I did with uh, Brian Ingerson. Again, a good, yeah. good course because you work with the far, you know, with the allies, and you're obviously having arguments with the Americans. They're saying route, we're saying route. Uh, but yeah, again, 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 and a, a good two week course. And then my final course was uh, the one I did with you, uh, uh, Fergie, the Alert Medic. Again, what a fantastic course! That yeah, was. that was a great course, mate. You know, sticking things in each other and and suturing bits and pieces up, especially when. Remember that time when we had to uh, suture the uh, the orange up or whatever, or, or, or the bit of meat, and uh, everybody partnered off. It's pig skin, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, and then and then everybody partnered off except for pig pen and the old doctor. Oh, you can come with me then. <laughs> <laughs> I think he pulled half his arm off. But yeah, that was my I last think, course. I think what's good about that course back then was I think how there was nothing like it in the British Army at the time. And if I remember rightly, Pete, one of the medics was a, a young SF guy that had been in Vietnam. Mm, yeah. And so, you know, he'd done a couple of combat tours in Vietnam. And I don't know if it would get past health and safety now, because we came out of that course looking like heroin addicts with putting IVs in each other and everything like that. I managed to spray one of the uh, the classroom walls with uh, blood because uh, I put the IV in, took the IV out and didn't join the uh, the tail line. And, you know, my blood straight over the wall, like, you know. <laughs> But I think, I think no, that, that, that training centre, well, the training we did there was probably some of the best that we could ever do in the British Army because there was no equivalent, um, probably less for the SF side, for the for regular forces to train to that sort of level. And if you think about the CQB, all right, they use this blue ammunition so they could use really tight ranges and they just throw it into a wood and off we go. The medical training was excellent. The specialist recognition, you learned Cyrillic and Russian as well as everything else. I mean, it was a steep learning curve and a very tough old test. And I remember when I did my survival course down there, they didn't, we didn't do battlefield survival anymore. It was basically make some stuff, make your compass, there you go, and off you go. You had All you had was what you had in your pocket. And obviously you got searched beforehand because they moved away from here's a rifle and here's your belt kit. They decided to go a little bit more Robertson Crusoe so you had to make your hat, make your gloves, pair of flip flops on your feet, and off you off you run round all day. Yeah. I thought it was also good the way we actually worked with other NATO countries. Yeah, because you know some of them, uh, you know, I had a giggle with them. You know, you know, we had we had one Italian crying, you know, because really, he didn't walk any further, like you know, and, uh, Germans. But you know. I always found though it, it was you always picked up something decent from somebody. No matter how they might have lacked a skill somewhere, but you always came away mm. with a, with something useful. And I think as well, certainly the courses that we're talking about, like the CQB, uh, a, a lot of the uh, the UKSF took the lead on things like that. So most of the ranges that you did down there were run by UKSF, and uh, you know the two week range package that that two week CQB was one of the, my best courses I yeah, ever did. Yeah, uh, unbelievably good. I mean, again. When I did my four and five and all that sort of stuff in the UK, on the UK side, it was nowhere near as as intense or as um, close as my CQB course with some NATO colleagues shooting around me instead of shooting at the targets. So it made it more interesting. If what, I did you think of the G- what did you think of the G3, Peter's a weapon? 
the uh, G3 rifle. It, yeah, I mean it worked. It was a 7.62 long. It, you know, I, I, yeah, I liked it. It was, mm. it was, it was, you know, it was a kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. You know, it worked. It was easy to strip down, easy to clean. I mean, I was, uh, the other thought about the school was that I think the, um, especially the SES were a bit uh, miffed at having to bring in the CFT because when we first went down there, there was no CFT. Basically, you expected to be fit, but because of some of the fitnesses that people were turning up with, not the British, uh, they had to put that 10 mile in. So, you you know, all of a sudden they were having to waste a morning putting a flipping 10 mile, yeah. well, basically run mm. with 45 pounds worth of kit on your back. And they, they weren't very happy having to bring that in, but, you know, again, 45 pounds. I never found out why the Brits pulled out. I don't know if it was down to money or just uh, like yeah, take I think up it what horses got. Was it like a money, was it? Yeah, basically, I think you know, the, the, the down structure of the British Army just didn't have the instructors to to run it. Uh, obviously, they're pulling out of NATO. They, that's when they started. I mean, I was there instructing uh, on the come to capture when we actually moved from Ryan, um, to, to Fullendorf, and it wasn't the same. It just wasn't the same. Camp wasn't the same. Everything. I mean, the interrogation was okay, interrogation, but the places we had to use were classrooms and stuff like that. Yeah, but Fullendorf wasn't wasn't uh, buying garden, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I had an incredibly good nightlife as well. If I remember rightly, that was the other good thing about it. you went you went down there. It was a a good night out on the beer, and if I remember rightly, you got extra money for being down there because the the rations that you were served in the camp weren't classified as good enough for Brits. Oh no, yeah, you you, you had to pay for your um, the German food basically. Yeah. Um, that's what you get paid for. I mean. You could go up the caserna as much as you wanted to, or just not pay the Germans and eat up there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've hammered on about R two I quite a bit over the last couple of podcasts, and the reason for that was that due to special observers' role and where we operated forward of our own troops, and the fact that we were expected to infiltrate through enemy territory, we were classified as um, prone to capture. So that was one of the reasons we had to carry out uh, and pass the resistance interrogation and conduct after, conduct after capture training at the LERP school. And as we said in the last podcast as well, not only did you have to do it to get into patrols, uh, as part of your qualification to be a sergeant patrol commander, you had to go to Hereford and do the Army Combat Survival Instructor course as well. So the roots of this requirement can really be traced back to the Korean War in the 50s. Uh, and it's largely a forgotten war, but Nearly a 1,000 UK servicemen and some civilians were captured by North Korean and Communist China forces, and they were held in various camps near Pyongyang and villages along the Yalu River. And when they were in these camps, they found themselves subjected to a prolonged effort by the enemy to undermine their allegiance to the Crown and attempts to enlist them in various propaganda campaigns directed against the UN war effort. So, again... If anybody want to get the head into Korea, there's some outstanding regimental actions there, such as the Gloucesters at the Battle of Imjin, and they were directly supported by 170 independent mortar battery with 120 millimetre mortars and four five regiment Royal Artillery with 25 pounders. And for three days, this infantry brigade of Brits thwarted the Chinese Spring Offensive. Um, the, most of the Gloucesters were captured. And the brigade lost a quarter of its strength, suffering a thousand casualties. Uh, and the US in the same battle lost 1,500 men. So that sort of is when they realised they had to do something about conduct after capture. Um, interestingly, a lot of the units involved in the Battle of Imjin were awarded a US presidential unit citation, which is the highest uh, American award for heroism and gallantry. So if anybody's interested in the Korean War, Max Hastings' book, The Korean War, is a good entry to the campaign. And we always like a book and a film tie-in. So plenty of black and white films there, Port Chop Hill. But the one that me and Kev were talking about the other day was The Manchurian Candidate. Not the crappy remake of about five years ago, but the original with Old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra. And that's about an American serviceman who's brainwashed in Korea. And he's came, he comes back and he runs for Congress. And uh, it's all about how the Chinese have brainwashed him to assassinate the president. So that's worth a good link. So, Pete, really, um, you've got more experience than most with uh, resistance interrogation training and uh, conduct after capture. So can you give us a bit of an indication on um, how this training was conducted? Well, I'd, I'd like to go really back into 
the, how it affected the British Army or armed forces after Korea. I mean, we've always had uh, uh, some kind of resistance to interrogation training uh, from the Second World War, where but it was mainly officers. And with the lack of um, access to media that the Germans had, uh, obviously with the, it was a full war, so we weren't letting them broadcast left, right and centre. Uh, not really much of it came to light until many years later. But it looks like to say that everybody talked. There's nobody that resisted wholeheartedly in any interrogation. You will always talk. But you're correct. It all really changed for the British Army after Korea. Um, if you look at the statistics, it was horrendous. I mean, uh, the United States, 43% of the, their captivities, com, you know, cooperated either wholeheartedly or to some kind of uh, degree. 43%. That was 29 for the UK and only 1% for the Turkish. One person. Uh, 12% of the US, 8% of the uh, UK, and 99% of the Turkish resisted wholeheartedly. Uh, dying in captivity, 44% of captivities, or well, 44% of the United States died in captivity. Uh, 20, uh, 15 for us, and no Turks. Now they say, well, why were the Turks so good? Well, actually, it was they were treated better by the North Koreans than they were by their own army. So that's why <laughs> they did a lot better. One person sort of gave any information up. And when the actual war finished, they didn't want to go home. But this brought out the first... I know. <laughs> this brought the first report out in 1955. Uh, Major General C.E.A. Firth. He was Director of Personal uh, Services in the War Department. And all three services were represented and uh, they um, thrashed around. And basically, in, in August 55, they came out with, you know, a KISS simple principle. And that was, you know, soldiers servicemen you know navy army air force it's too much to think about things while you're in captivity so let's keep it simple and they brought out the big four name rank number date of birth and for anything else i cannot answer that question and that was in 1955 and that stuck with the british arm or the armed forces until uh, 1997 when they said well hang on a minute on your dog tags you've got two other ex um, bits of information your religion and your blood group why can't you give them <laughs> so it then turned to big six uh, obviously, after the Gulf War, we had different bits and pieces, but uh, that was that, that's what really started the the, the meat of R to I training. Um, but that was only at uh, instructional level. So uh, they turned around and said, everybody in the British Art or British forces will be instructed at unit level in R to I, and that was mandatable. Everybody, the CO was responsible for that kind of training, but that was just instructional. The RAF were by, by by instructional, Pete. What what what? what... Do you mean because I don't remember getting any R to I training? I think before it came to the troop. Well, that's naughty for your CO. Basically, you send a um, regimental person to Ashford. He did the conduct after capture instructors course, which was a week mm -hmm. long, uh, and then he went. Sorry, it's three days in the end. Yeah, three days long, and he went back to the unit, and he was meant to give lectures on how to behave, what to you're um, going to get, what's going to happen to you, the different uh, methods of interrogation and. Uh, the difference between interrogation and uh, conditioning. Yeah. Because uh, you're never going to be um, tortured under interrogation. Never. Nobody, not any force anywhere in the world will, in, will torture you while you're in being interrogation or being interrogated. It doesn't get any information. But uh, like some of our colleagues that didn't do the course or didn't do the trading because it was volunteers, uh, if you don't know that conditioning is what you, is when you're tortured, yeah, and you yeah. will be conditioned, i.e. one of our pilots, he was crying because he had some toilet paper stuff down his flight suit and they set it on fire and they didn't ask me any questions. Well, if he'd done the course, he would have known he would have been conditioned. He wasn't being interrogated. But uh, again, they, they the report came out that only special forces prone to capture and air crew and other sort of special sort of units would receive actual practical interrogation against uh, a hostile or uh, enemy force that would not play by the Geneva Conventions. As an interrogator, I wasn't interested in uh, special forces. I wasn't interested in prone to capture because I knew, or we knew, we, we had to get information and we needed information quickly. We knew that special forces were isolated, so they didn't know any other information. Uh, Air. Mm. Well, okay, they could give you. Uh, they were always interrogated, but special force, especially not. If I had time, I might have a word with them. But if you either caught them right next to an MSR main supply route, next to a power yeah. station, next to some pylon, you know, <clears throat> what are you doing? I can't ask that question. You're looking at it. You're like, yeah, okay, 
we I was interested in senior officers because they knew stuff and they didn't do any training. And the amount of information we got out of you know senior officers, it was great because they just fell for everything. You'd give them a um, a line or something like that, and they just bit, bit, bit because they had no training, no practical training. Pete, are you able just to before we go on? Are you able just to cover how you ended up in that role? Um, yeah, I basically I did my PhD and TQ like you did, and got on well. I uh, passed my uh, promotion to staff sergeant. I got my staff sergeant, and you really needed an ERE. And I'd been with the battery troop battery since nineteen or nineteen ninety two, sorry eighty two, yeah nineteen eighty two, and I hadn't gone anywhere. I've done operational tours with the battery or with other units, but I had not got anywhere. I'd not, so basically it was. There's a two-year ERE posting. Do you want to do it? Go shout officers. Yeah, great. So that's what I did. And so I turned up. I did so two just, years. Just, so just just for a non-military listeners, so you did a prison handling tactical question course, which is mm-hmm. a three-day course that you talked about earlier on, and you go back and you'd be a unit instructor. No, that was Khaki. Khaki, come down after capture instructor. Was oh, sorry. Course. Prison handling tactical question is the week-long course where you are uh, – you interrogate as in the, the first phase. You're trying to thin yeah, out yeah, everybody yeah. who's going to go into uh, the interrogation world. world, And uh, so you do a week of shouting at people. And then uh, and then after you've done that, that's when you went and did your um, your ERE, your extra re- uh, external regimental employment, which uh, normally people go away and do two years to get a sort of a different mm-hmm. report. Yeah. And you joined an organization that inter- carried out interrogation training on uh, people uh, who are going through various courses. Is, is that a correct yeah, assumption? Yeah, yeah, it was a two-year ERA posting, and we were the the trainees of everybody that was prone to capture, air crew, uh, any kind of special forces, Northern Ireland, uh, other places that people were going. We, we did we did um, uh, R2I training. We also did uh, hostage training as well. So we briefed people how to behave if they ever taken hostage, which obviously was completely different to being a, a POW. That was two years. Uh, I was two years of interrogator, and then the position of chief instructor there turned up. Uh, I said, I'll do it. So I stayed for another two years. So I was there for you, two and two, four. I had a great time. Civvies. So how did you, I can understand how your air crew, uh, SF, end up doing the interrogation phases as part of their qualification courses. How, how did senior officers end up being interrogated by you? Because um, one of the big ideas decided one day they were doing an exercise and they would, uh, he left, they left loads of information lying around. And we were chatting, I think we were at Thetford on an exercise and they were in the same sort of like uh, area doing uh, fish trading, fighting somebody's house. And, uh, we just started talking to her and I was saying, you know, we were all saying, I'm not, you know, we, we're not interested in special forces because they're not going to tell you anything. We, we want to get hold of your lot because you do know things. You know, you know, battle plans. You know where units are. You're older. You're softer. And we want to get hold of you. And the quicker I can get information, there's, it, that, that's all it is. It's, you know, I need information and I need it now. I don't need it in 24 hours' time. And trying to, you know, get information out of, a stupid special forces, you know, prone to capture as we were stubbing. We're not going to give you information. Well, you know, you can pull me. You know, I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you. Whereas some of the senior officers, major and above, uh, they were just, you know, they were yip, 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 yip. Couldn't stop talking sometimes. And the information you got out of them was what you needed. And you passed it up and they couldn't believe it sometimes. The things we were getting out of them. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Kevin and I were talking in preparation for the pod about um, in the Second World War in the UK, they took over an old country house and uh, they got all senior German army, Navy and Air Force officers and put them into this country house. And then they dragged them in for interrogation and uh, they, you know, being Germans, never said a thing. But what they did was when they put them into the the lounges with a nice fire going, you know, and, and a brew handy, the rooms were all bugged. And that's where the real debriefs took place because they bugged these rooms and it was amazing what they captured when these Germans were talking. And they still do it today. That's that's one of the ploys we used to get information out of people. Logical, anything logical, you could get information out of people because, yeah. you know, it's you know when you're an educated person and somebody puts a logical piece of info, you know, uh, uh, in front of you, you, you can't not talk. Well, they couldn't, mm. you know. Whereas, you know, rough end of the trench people like us, well, I've been told not to say anything. I haven't got a clue what you're on about. 
Yeah, so I'm not yeah. going to tell you, and, and that's <laughs> and that's why we found we found with uh, you know at Hereford, no nothing out of them. Uh, Lerp School, very 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 few times did we get information out of people, and uh, and a lot of time we got anything out of at Lerp School. It was unfortunately not special forces or spawned to capture troops. It was other units that had, you know stopped on the run and and basically met women, which they then decided to keep their phone number. So obviously we phoned the girls up, had them brought in, and then basically ruined their lives. Right. <laughs> Kev was also, you're, you're saying, Kev, about the best German interrogator in the Second World War when we're having that conversation. Yeah, he was, he, was, uh, he, was, he was Luftwaffe. So the RAF or Air Force, US Air Force, were all housed, ability together in a uh, big old uh, chateau or wherever it was. And... Um, they did condition in a little bit, obviously, but not in the same way that we did R to Y. Uh, so they were taken into interrogation, so they were questioned, and then they were taken back to their cells or their rooms, as it was, by the guard. The guard was the interrogator. He built a relationship over time, so when they go for exercises in the, in the gardens, they walk with their guard. He pretend he couldn't speak much English, so he'd converse a little bit. And over time... They started to talk to him more than because when they went to interrogation, they went right. I can't say nothing, but like you said about when the Germans went into other rooms and the rooms were bogged, they would let the guard down. With the guard, they let the guard down because they treated them as a guard and not the interrogator. And it's a fantastic book, and the Americans adopted him after the Second World War, took him back over to America, and he helped formulate some of their um, techniques as well because it was such a clever way to get the information and such a simple way as well. Pete, I've got a question for you, and it's one that's sort of puzzled me over the last decade. Bear in mind what you've said about, you know, torture and all the rest of it. Why do you think the CIA and uh, the Americans became such fans of waterboarding in Iraq and Afghanistan and places? Uh, Americans are strange, uh, strange creatures uh, with their interrogation. Uh, we went over to the States a few times, uh, and, and they didn't – Special, well, they didn't go on to exactly being captured. They went on to behaving in uh, prisoner war camps. That was where their main uh, thing was. And they just thought, uh, especially with the waterborne, they just thought they can get information out of people and it will be credible. And it's never been credible, never been proved credible. You know, you're, you know, you're being drowned or you're being electrocuted. You, you know, you're going to tell them what they want to know. The, the, the best thing that we've always found is, is, is their own mind. Your mind will, will run ragged. Uh, when you're when you're sort of threatened, when you're conditioned, a couple of times in in the Gulf War when we debriefed people, one one of the pilots he was taken into a room and he said, right, uh, tomorrow morning I'm going to ask you ten questions. For every question you don't answer, I'm going to cut one of your fingers off. Go go back into the room. So you know, all night he was like, I'm a pilot. I can't fly without fingers. It was just conditioning. They weren't going to do it. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. and I think CIA. Well, I think they're just a bit crazy. Uh, some of the things they do. You know, you don't get information. We've always proved that we got more information quicker out of using our sort of self-induced system-induced pressures than torture. Condition, yeah, that's great, you know, because you can use it as an interrogator. You know, somebody's outside beating the shit out of you and you just turn around and say, look, if you talk to me, I can keep you in here. If you don't talk to me, you've got to go out there. You know, and that's sort of, you know, system-induced pressure that you can put on people. And, but uh, you, you mentioned conditioning a little bit, a couple of times there, Pete, and you sort of alluded to a little bit. So could you just sort of... Just expand on that a little bit more about what what the what it, what what was used, what sort of things were used, and mainly and, and how it affected people. Mainly main, mental pressure, mental pressure of things. Uh, you put people in position in, in situations where they think that something's going to happen to them, um, and you 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 take them out of you know that you're blindfolded, so you haven't got sound or sight. You, you, you've played white noise so you can't hear things. You're put against the stress position so you lose you know, sensation in your hands when they go to sleep. You, you sit in stress. Uh, and basically, you know, you're now uncomfortable. You, you've not got you know, your friends around you, although they are, but you can't see them because you're blindfolded in your white noise. And your, your mind starts really racing and playing lots of um, uh, tricks on you. And it's just mental pressure. And you can crack people wide open with mental pressure and not um, torturing them. Yeah, again, you can use little bits like um, Don Nichols did when he was set on fire. We've had uh, one one of the pilots, uh, or sorry, he was a navigator. Uh, he was blown out of the sky by his own aircraft and, uh, or sorry, his own bomb. And uh, 
parachute got out the aircraft and he was blindfolded soldier dragged him along the ground and he was dragged along and he put him up against um, a concrete sort of bollard and he was thinking he said to me he said i thought he was going to chop my arm off and all he was doing was making him more comfortable but that was the, the you know the mental pressure that he was under yeah. he had actually gone through his r2i so then that clicked in and he started giving it well th- you know this is what's happening and he knew this is what you know he was on initial capture and he knew what was going to happen where the ones that had never gone or you know all the RAF used to do was not do the course. They just tried their hardest not to do the course because it was uncomfortable. Um, whereas the Navy, it was, if you don't do the course, you don't get to fly. And and the people that hadn't done the, you could tell the difference of people that had done the course and the people that hadn't done, how they resisted and how well they did and how not well they did. And two of the ones that wrote That's it up in the book didn't do well. <laughs> It's interesting. Noise has always been used. Who, who was it? Was it Noriega or somebody in Panama a number of years ago where the Yanks surrounded his his house and uh, played heavy metal music twenty four seven to mm. to sort of condition him to yeah, get out of the house? Deprivation of, of sleep. So it's a great one because you start seeing things and you start talking. I mean, I was talking to one of the first female fighter pilot, and she she said she was hallucinating from um, things jumping over my shoulder. It was great, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interrogation. It was uh, it was an eye opener of what you could get out of people, and how easy it was to basically get people off their big four or big six. And later on, there was a um, the military decided that pilots couldn't keep keep to the big four. So after a while, they could start releasable information. And what a laugh that was! Because once you start talking, we had all sorts of problems. Well, they had all sorts of problems. You know, because what do you talk about? What do you start talking about that isn't going to give information away? People were starting sort of basic conversations and you just took it on and you run them ragged and they, you know, just keeping it to the big four was the far the best way of resisting. Mm-hmm. I think when, once it's out of the bottle, it's pretty hard to get back in, isn't it? It's, well, we've always said that, you know, even if you give information away, go back into the big four. You know, it, it, it's the easiest way. If they don't, get, you know, it, and the other thing I used to do was uh, on the two hour um, monotonous. I would say to, I would get the bloke going or woman, you know, name, rank, number, date of birth, name, rank, number, date of birth, name, rank, number, date of birth, keep going. And so if I could get them just continually get, giving their name, rank, number, date of birth, and I'd sat there drinking coffee. I didn't even, I didn't ask them anything. And for two hours, they just asked and, you know, they've not been, they've been on the run. They've been, it's normally at nighttime when they did that. So they'd probably been in holding for 14 hours. And then for two hours, they just gave me their name, rank, number, date of birth and, you know, and at the end, I used to say, right, oh, no, and then you finish with your bridge, carrot and stick. This is what I'm going to ask you next time. If you give me that in, you know, I will give you this. And if you don't, this is going to happen to you. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, you know, you're going to do this for another two hours. I'll talk. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, Kev, so um, then, R2Y was then part of the mental preparation resilience for, in our case, for the Special Observer Soldier. And, again, part of that self-belief through training, preparation, that we could operate and survive uh, behind enemy lines. And I think the battlefield would have been obviously very confusing. So one of the survival skills was not only that part, but um, as NATO forces got rolled up and captured, uh, potentially, if we were getting captured, we'd be rolled up in the same mass of people and hopefully we'd have evaded, after TQing, probably evaded the interrogation if they thought that we weren't a specialised unit and got thrown into the into the pot with everybody else. Kev, do you just um, want to explain tactical question, TQ, that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, tactical question, which is the initial part, which is, again, on the conduct after capture course, uh, prisoner handling tactical question, you start, it's the initial phase in the battlefield. You start asking the immediate questions of the individual and to see if they're of interest or not, looking at their equipment. Uh, and you're going to have to make a very quick decision, especially if you've got, as with, I'd imagine, the Third World War, there'd be a lot of people getting caught quite quickly, especially as the Soviet Union uh, Western forces were rolling over the border and pushing us as we did that uh, collapsing bag back to uh, hopefully where the the reinforcements were going to arrive from America and Britain and everywhere else. So when I I was reading this and uh, looking at what the general said, I imagine that the battlefield wouldn't have been an empty place with many units wandering around, isolated, cut off, because obviously 
we all got taught that the Soviet Union tactics was if you hit a hard point and you can't defeat it quickly, you just go around it and you mop them up later with the second echelon. So all these people eventually would go into the bag as well. And potentially for us, because it was going to be so hard for us to evade and catch up with our own forces or our self-propelled and we're on foot with Bergens, for us to catch up and our survivability was obviously always in question whether we would survive or get captured. So I've, I've got a question for Peter. You had, <clears throat> excuse me, Pete. So really, when we did the R2I, you had 24 hours with eight hours interrogation and the stress positions in that 24 hours. Was that 24 hours fixed for a reason? Uh, I.e., was it about the just 24 hours to give you enough time to for your knowledge to expire? Was that the reason for it? Basically, 12, 24 hours codes would have been changed every 24 hours when you when you're in a, a normal regiment. Every 24 hours, your codes changed and everything changed. So that's all you had was 24 hours to get the information out of uh, somebody. Uh, I mean, you had the 12 hours beforehand. But again, that was, um, take that as a pinch of salt. If you've got somebody, we used to wander around in the capture areas as well. And if we saw somebody that we wanted to talk to, you know, you used to pull off their um, sandbag, because nine times out of ten, that's what they had. And you just ask them a question. If they answered in a certain way, you're in. And a lot of the times, believe it or not, because it was an exercise scenario and we used to have, say, 50 people captured and you had to decide which one you wanted to interrogate. You walked up to somebody, you dragged him on one side and say, what's your, you know, what regiment are you? If he like stuttered and went, um, well, um, I, I can't tell you that. Yeah, sit down. If he turned around and said, I can't ask that question. Yeah, come on, lad. Straight away. You know, you <laughs> so, knew. so in some respects, your knowledge po- uh, definitely pointed uh, Indicated you as a person of interest. Yep. And then saying if we caught people that had no rank, no insulin, yep, get in the bag, mate. Because you're not wearing any rank. Why aren't you wearing any rank? You know, uh, it's just little things like that. Again, different. And you could obviously, I can imagine as well, just by the way they're dressed and carrying themselves a lot of time, you could select them on that as well. Um, just uh, somewhat, somewhat. But again, you, it just it depended. But you could certainly tell certain, you know, when you caught six or seven people together and they were like, you know, really well built and none of them were flipping Johnny Fat people and uh, yeah you know, <laughs> on you go mate you know. and again you you open their burger and they're the bits and pieces you just looked at them and smiled and they're like you know you know fair cop fair cop but again you know you weren't going to get really any information out of them but again that was the training side for reality you wouldn't do that yeah but they're in, they're of interest to you you would isolate them from the other lot or from the general capture people but again I, I wanted to get information out of sources that I knew I was going to get something out of not bang my head against the wall trying to get something out of a special forces person which I knew he didn't know anyway because he'd been isolated or you know and there's always that phrase try and be the grey man wasn't there but yeah, yeah. judging by what you've just said there it can be quite hard to be the grey man and not stand out yeah I'd say that being the grey man is more while you're being interrogated you know not standing out and getting extra punishment right. because we had the loads of uh, when uh, the East German uh, special forces was being taken into GSG nine. <laughs> I was, you know, I had about three fights in the interrogation room. You know, they were mad. As soon as you said anything, they went for you. So you had to sort of give them a good. You know, obviously, you weren't meant to, but you had to, you had to defend yourself. So, oh, your boxing training came in hand. Oh well, metal mug with a hot cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, that was quite good fun. But uh, yeah, for it, it, there was different factors that would you know stick or you know, stick you out for interrogation or for a little bit, a little more look at you. You didn't have to, even though uh, we were rigid with, you did two and 10 and then you did, you know, eight and 24. When we were running it for real, you know, you might've dragged somebody in, talked to him for an hour. Yeah. Get rid of this one. Well, I want to have, you know, because you've got to get information out of, you know, the most people you can. And if you were banging your head against the wall, what's the point? You know, for reality, yeah, it's no point. I need information and I want somebody, you know, I want to get it easy. I don't want to have to work for it. Well, thanks, that. Pete. That, that's interesting. And uh, so we'll move on now, and we're just going to switch subjects entirely. Um, and you already alluded to this earlier on when you were talking about uh, the level of recognition training that we had to do as uh, special observers. So I'm not sure that many people are aware that during the Cold War, NATO and Warsaw Pact had military missions which operated overtly in each other's areas of operations. And these were known as Brixmas and Socksmith, respectively. So, Pete, if I remember rightly, you did a bit of a, a, a placement with Brixmas. I did. So, can you just explain what Brixmas was and, and, and what it did? 
What Brexit is actually stands for the British Commander in Chief's mission to the Soviet forces in Germany. We didn't just have Brexit, there was an American element, Muslim, and um, a French element as well. And it's from Trumsmlm or FMLM. And that was the French mission uh, to a uh, commander to the uh, Soviet Union. And again, where Berlin was split in three, it was exactly the same British area, American area, and, uh, and the uh, French area. Now, uh, as you said, it was set up after the end of the Second World War, and it was basically a liaison unit. And we were meant to liaise with our allies, which the, the Soviets were. But, and again, it was important to some of the listeners that, you know, not like today, you couldn't wander into uh, East Germany. You couldn't wander into, you know, around Russia. Russians couldn't wander out or the East Germans couldn't wander around. So um, Bricksmiths really really quickly turned into a spying unit, basically. And what they did was go around and look at units, try and get bits and pieces off of uh, different uh, bits of kit. Uh, The new uh, reactive armour, that was one of the uh, top sort of bits of kit to get hold of. And basically going around uh, East Germany, to spy on the Russians and find out what they were doing, what bits of kit they had. And it was quite funny that in actual Bricksmiths, you had two boards. One was what we told NATO they had, and the other board was what they really had. And what they really had was far more frightening than what we used to tell you know. But again, you couldn't say how we, you know that they had it, because they would say, well, how did you find that out? Well, we were spying on you, obviously. But as I said, it was so, out to the spy unit. I was fortunate. I did two weeks up there and got to do a couple of trips over to, to the east at that point. But... Can you just cover how 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 you operated, Pete, and the, the sort of how you went across, how many were, you know, that that sort of thing? Well, the problem was that that's what the troop went up to do. We went up to go on tour. I shouldn't have gone to Brixmas. I was a patrol commander, but because they forgot to positive it vets, which was like um, investigating somebody to make sure that he didn't wear women's underwear, he wasn't blackmailable, or he was able to uh, keep secrets, basically. I had that for a job I was doing in Northern Ireland. And basically, the only person was me, and I was a patrol commander. So I turned up at Berlin expecting you know, to do all this secret stuff. And the Inc. Corps decided that they stuck us in a, an office as a clerk. And that's all that the lads did was clerk from update maps and stuff like that. So I wasn't very happy about that. And I, actually, when I came back, I, I recommended that we don't continue Bricksmiths as that. But basically, what Brixmas was, uh, you used to work in a car. They were used at the Glenda vehicles, the Glenda wagons, the G wagons. Uh, you had a three man crew, driver, um, commander, and uh, sort of like a second driver. And they used to go across the Glenica Bridge. They didn't cross Chesterwood Charlie. They went across the Glenica Bridge, which, uh, has anybody seen the um, Bridge of Spies? That's the bridge they used to go across. And then just used to wander into East Germany. Uh, we had a uh, map or, or documents of specific targets and they basically went round and looked at them and got information on what they were, you know, what, what was there. Sort of like they also did with you had a, um, a, a, an armoured train going past, then they used to take all the information off of that and basically go and see what was cutting around East Germany. Can you give um, obviously? It was. I remember when I went up there. I went up there on the the British military train, mm. um, and uh, you know they timed it perfectly. So when you cross the border, you're all sat having your 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 lunch. And uh, you know, I was like a, a junior NCO at the time, and there was generals on there, and they're all eating the same food and sat in the same compartment as the Soviets came on to inspect your your passes. But can you just give people a sort of a feel for what, what West Berlin was like then, Pete? Um, well, the train itself, I mean, that started because of the, the um, Allied access to Berlin that we were given, and it started in ni- July 1945. And basically, it was a, a military train, the Berliner. It ran daily from uh, Charlottenburg, West Germany, West Berlin, to Brunswick, West Germany, and vice versa. And it used to run once one way and once the other a day. Uh, even though they were British... Or, or German carriages, that it was actually a DDR East German train. And you're right, it was designed to stop off at the checkpoints and it was the silver service. And obviously the Russians used to look through the window and mouths watering at this, all the food we used to have. But Berlin itself, I, I love Berlin. I <laughs> thought it was great. I mean, the, lo- the locals, they liked you, which is quite unusual for West Germany because they knew the only reason they were free was because of who was there. Um, but it was like two different cities. You had 
like nightclubs or clubs that used to open at 11 o'clock in the morning for the night shift. And it, it just ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Funny on the underground because you used to get on the underground. And if you, you uh, wore a uniform, you could travel in free. But you used to stop in East. You weren't allowed to get off there, obviously. But yeah, you used to stop in East Germany, East German uh, railway uh, underground stations. Um, but yeah. What the underground yeah, is? Yeah, went into East Germany. Just the way it ran. They didn't mm-hmm. redig it when it was, you know, when, when. Oh, so they just carried, yeah, you carried yeah. it on even though the wall yeah. was above. Yeah, yeah got but it. obviously they had the, the checks on the way out, so you you, you just couldn't yeah, uh, yeah. you couldn't uh, go across there. Uh, we are we did go into uh, East Berlin through Checkpoint Charlie, and we also did um, showing the flags. They used to get uh, opera tickets and ballet tickets, and we had to go across as bricks was to uh, to go to them, and that was quite funny as well. And you know you're, you're in a you're in a ballet and. Uh, that interval, this, they, all the rich people are sat there with one bottle of champagne, and you've got like one each because you were given money to go and uh, to go over there. Do you know what, mate? Sorry to interrupt you, Pete, but I just have to say, when we started these podcasts, if if Pete Walsh had sat saying he'd been to the ballet, <laughs> I would never have I believed. Know. And it was Swan Lake as well, so you can imagine with the the intelligent men from Morecambe and Wise, and they got to that part of the thing, and and we just fell about laughing, and all the you know the whole top echelon of East Germany is looking at us. Why are they laughing? Because they've never seen Morgan and Wise the intelligence men. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but the fun part was when you got back, you were always debriefed by the, by the ink or trying to get through things when you'd had like a couple of bottles of champagne, what a gig all that was. Uh, but it was always in number twos. And you know, we also had a mission. House. I mean, we had a mission house in Potsdam as well, which was um, a massive, great uh, house on, on is the that lake. the East or is yeah, that yeah, the yeah, No, the, in the East and Potsdam. And uh, we used to go cut across there, and it was there was a couple of restaurants that used to have a five year waiting list for, and we had a permanent table there, and it was you know just go and show show off to these Germans that you know we were rich and you're not. So the, that was a was that permanently manned? Yeah, well? you always had a you had a, um, a husband and wife team there, and that. Uh, so the actual mission. Did the did the socks miss have the same then? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. I don't I think they did. Germany. No, because I remember in Germany, we all got briefed about Socksmiths. And obviously, especially on big exercises, uh, one of the things everyone was briefed on is the exercise instruction. We're going to do this, this, and this, and be aware of Socksmiths cars. And you got a refresh all the time because every time we went out, especially the big garrison towns, there was always a, a chance the Socksmiths was going to be around. But I, yeah, I just wondered if the Socksmiths did exactly I'm, the same as Brick. I'm not sure they had they had a mission house. Uh, I know the difference was that when the Soxons came across, they had an R and P, you know, three liters yes, yeah, following it. Yes, yeah, well, they to used to, yeah. you know. I mean, I did a, a couple of um, shorter tours in in East East Berlin, and we were cutting around in the G wagon, and they had like a Chabant trying to follow us, and that was, you know, yeah, and that yeah. was the difference. They were trying to try, chase you in the Chabant, and you had a, you know, a uh, hundred and ten thousand mark flipping g wagon and we used to like yeah, right i'm yeah. going across this field and they're like you know come back come back no <laughs> uh, yeah. i went i went i took my good lady out to berlin about seven years ago and uh barely recognizable but i i went to the kerfersten dam the coup dam which if i remember correctly and you might well tell me i'm talking rubbish here but i remember the coup dam back in the the olden days was uh the place where all the the nightclubs and uh the, the ladies of uh, that ancient profession used to hang about and the coup dam now is like high-end shops with designer gear in it yeah, everything's changed isn't it when as i said we used to go to this nightclub it opened at 11 o'clock in the morning and all the ladies of the night used to come into there and we just have a laugh with them. We know, you know, nothing ever went on. It was just we had a real laugh with them, and they weren't working, and they just wanted to let their hair down, and yeah, that was quite a good laugh. And Mon Cherie's with a famous bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm married now. Any soldier that served in Berlin ladies <laughs> remember Mon Cherie's. Yeah. <laughs> so best move on, I think. There. <laughs> I know. Well, I was gutted actually because I I left in the July and the war came down in the August. I was absolutely gutted because they said the parties that went on then was unbelievable. We had a great laugh, but you know when the war came down, August uh, eighty nine, uh, yeah, they just you know it was crazy times. Well, as usual, we're coming towards the end of the podcast, so we uh, we move forward with Desert Isle of Dits, and this is where the guest picks his favourite book, hopefully military, a film, and a luxury item. So, Pete. Over to you. Well, I'm afraid mine is Vietnam-based because 
I was in Singapore, uh, 1966 to 1968 and a half with my father. Uh, we were based at HMS Terror. And I always remember as a young four-year-old getting briefed, if you see anybody at the bar with short hair, don't go and, you know, bug him. Obviously, took no notice of that. And we were jumping all over him. And they were obviously um, the Marines and the pilots back uh, on R&R. &R, and they loved it. But uh, my film is uh, The Odd Angry Shot by uh, Tom, or directed by Tom Jeffrey. That's about the Australian SAS in Vietnam. Now, believe it, the reason why this has always been my f my favourite war film, uh, Vietnam film, was halfway through that film, they're in the jungle, and it's the only time I've seen a patrol commander use a prismatic compass to give a bearing for the lead scout to walk on. And every other film you see, they just cut through the jungle like they know where they are. And yeah, anybody yeah, that's yeah. been in the jungle, a cub, knows that you are lost, you know, 23 yeah. <laughs> hours 59 minutes of the day and for that to see that to actually see him stop use his prismatic compass and put a bearing onto lead scout i just thought to myself that is the film to what you know that's the, my film and i've always yeah. enjoyed it and believe it or not it was an anti-war also some of the patrol skills are pretty yeah good very and the well, contact you, skills, you... yeah the breaking contact yeah but that was an anti-war film would you believe i know i couldn't believe it i thought well if anything wants made you want to join the army it was a film like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i loved it but yeah, that's my film. Old Angry Shot. Book, uh, The Battle of the Long Time. Yeah. Now, this book was meant to, well, I, I, I thought, well, what book was that? Because I remember reading it, and apparently it didn't come out until uh, 1987. But I read about the Battle of Long Tang on uh, Crusader 80. We were basically umpires. So for four weeks, I sat in a 432 with a headset on on the radio, and I must have read book after book. And I remember reading the book about the Battle of Long Tang. And I was just, my draw was just on the, you know, 110 men fighting for 24 hours against two MVA regiments. And who saves the day? Sheldrake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the old the Royal Australian Regiment yeah. of Artillery. Yeah. You had, you know, well, it was, it was New Zealand yeah. as well. You had, the artillery yeah. with New Zealand. So New Zealand. Yeah, you had, uh, you had a, um, um, a battery of 105 pack howitzers, which is New Zealand, and half a battery of yeah. 155s, which is American, which I don't go into because yeah. they were just, and we know what 155s are like. You can't bring them within a football field of infantry because you just die. But yeah, that's that was that was the, my favourite book, the old angry uh, battle along tank because that battle, what amazing! You know, to do that, but don't see the no, film. Uh, uh, I've, I've, the yeah, film. is there is a documentary on YouTube which is actually that it starts yeah, yeah. with the 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 actual FOO saying if you don't bring that artillery yeah. in, we're all dead. And 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 yeah. I've I've had the hairs on my neck back. Um, or go up twice that and also going back to interrogation we used to have a, a co-pilot I told you about him uh, Bob Ankinson and he had the tape from his tornado being shot down well blown out the sky and again listening to that you just think oh my giddy aunt yeah. you know should have been me I mean, it's interesting as well those guys that fought at long time they only got sort of real recognition about 15 years Absolutely ago didn't shocking. they and, 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 yeah Shocking. Yeah, it's really badly yeah, treated. Their family, they have a they have a um, um, a reunion every year, and uh, there's actually a song they sing. There's a song from Lang Long Tang that they that they sing. Uh, that's again on on YouTube, uh, and again they've been battling for years to get the recognition because it's it's, it's yeah. what the Australian government did. You know, it's unbelievable. Why it was it was a brilliant battle. Yeah. And, and the thing again, uh, going back into it is after the battle, they went back into the jungle. And they buried all the Vietnamese, whereas the Americans have cut yeah. bits and pieces off, and they buried everything. They buried everybody and give them a full military um, um, burial. And then, thirty-six hours later, there was two banners in the jungle saying the three hundred five or three hundred eight NVA regiment salutes the Australian soldiers. And no um, POW, Australian POW, was treated badly because of how, oh, they, right, treated, okay. how they treated yeah. the people that they fought. Whereas, obviously, we know about them. And they pretty much dominated their area of operations as very well, much didn't so. they, the Very much so. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. They were very good. Saying so, that 50% were um, conscript. Yeah. Yeah, that, no, that's, a, that's a good point yeah. as well, yeah. yeah. But again, they conscript fought, they fought uh, uh, as we fought in, in, in Vietnam or in uh, Malaysia. Because, yeah. again, um, Rocky Ayers, he was on a training team uh, before Vietnam, and he was trying to teach the Americans how to fight. And basically, when they were teaching them how the British did it in, in Malaysia, the Americans said to him, we're going to be there six months, mate. We don't need to do this. 1964 to 1975 yeah. proved them wrong. Yeah. And my luxury item has to be what got me through everything 
a bottle of cherry brandy. <laughs> Any particular mate? No, nope. as long as it's got cherries and brandy in it, I don't care. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I always had a hit flask of cherry brandy and it got me through some bad times. <laughs> I'm still reeling from the ballet thing, mate. Trust me. It was good. Good giggle. It was a good giggle. I mean, they paid, you know, they gave you money to go. They paid for the tickets. And it was one, um, you got 10 East Marks to one West Marks. And they gave you 100 West Marks each. So you had 1,000 East Marks to go, you know. It was quite funny because you'd go in the bars and you could see where they were, all the um, microphones were. And you used to turn up half an hour early and they used to say, oh, complimentary drink, drinks at the bar. So you're at the bar drinking away and you can see him plugging everything in. And then you turn around to him and said, I don't want to sit there. I want to sit over there. Oh, complimentary beer at Jeers while we move all the, you know, uh, you know, it was, yeah. You expected Morecambe and Weiss to oh, walk around the corner. Oh dear, that was funny. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> so, needs uh, must. Exactly, mate. So Kevin, I always give a recommendation each week as well. So my recommendation this week is Armadillo, which is a 2010 Danish documentary about Danish soldiers in Afghanistan from the Guard Hussars Regiment. Uh, and it was a first tour of Helmand Province at a Ford operating base near Goresk named Fob Armadillo. Um, it's a very, there's an alleged killing of a, 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 a an Afghan combatant who's been wounded. It's proved wrong later on, but it's a very good insight into that Danish battle group's tour. And uh, I never served in Afghanistan, but a few of guys that I know who served there uh, always had quite good things to say about the Danish and uh, the way they conduct themselves out in Afghan. So that, that's a great book. Kev, I believe your recommendation this week as well? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Bomber Offensive by the then the Marshal of the Royal Air Force, Sir Arthur Harris. Um, obviously, with hindsight nowadays, people look on the Second World War and the bombing campaign of Europe and Germany uh, and have a view on it. But uh, I... It, it was written just after the Second World War. It was written by him. He gave his view, what the, you know, how it was then, um, how we were facing. You know, we were facing defeat. We had to take the war to Germany. Uh, we were we were fighting from an island. The only way to strike back was obviously maritime or from the air. And um, it's it's worth a read because you, you, it's the mindset of the time. Uh, we'll never feel it. You know, as a nation, we don't feel. The oppression of, a, of another another nation on the you know about to invade us, waiting for support from the Americans or anybody else. So I, I think it's worth a, a read to give you a different view of the bombing campaign. When everyone talks about it being actually you know we were bombing civilians, but it, it does justify it in some ways because it was about the war effort. You know the war machine couldn't run if the factories didn't run. The factories tanks were built by civilians, the bearings, the fuel. So. Really interesting to read. Big toll as well, 55,000 Bomber Command. Oh, yeah, massive. I mean, everyone forgets. Bomber Command, the, the, the attrition rate was horrendous. It was the First World War, I think, was it? First World Survivability was worse than an officer in the trenches in the First World War, I think. It was one of the During statistics. That phase, yeah. Right? Well, yeah. Because we were we had very little ground campaigns going on at the time. Uh, the Americans, every five, four of you got killed. And the British, every five, three got killed. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's oh, yeah. absolutely you know, horrendous. So eight out of ten for the Americans, and you know, six out of ten for us. You know, you know, yeah, absolutely horrendous when you think yeah. anything like that. Brave, brave yeah. men. Yeah. So, a big thank you to our guest, Pete, yeah. and you, the listener, for your support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. Uh, our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. Again, just like last last episode, Colin's in charge of all technical things. I'm not. You'll find us on all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, and now on YouTube. And if you have downloaded some iTunes and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review, as this is the best way of bringing to attention the series. And do word of mouth as well, tell everybody. On the next uh, episode, our guest is David Jones, who will cover the troop commander's perspective regarding the ongoing challenges of recruitment and selecting the appropriate people. The attachment of the late entry officers from 22 SAS to the troop and project ethos i've hopefully i've said that right but i've no doubt people will let me know if i haven't for which you'll need to download to discover more 
And finally, the transition from two small troops into separate regiments to the formation of 473 Battery. Thanks once again to Nick Beal for his continuing support and sponsorship to this series and offering technical support through his company ISAR. See you next time on The Unconventional Soldier.